Hi everybody, good afternoon. I'm Allie from Maine's Confetti Quill Farm. And today I am going to share with you some tips, basic procedure for incubating your quill eggs. Um, so if you're gonna be incubating quill eggs, you're going to be sourcing them from likely two or three different, different sources. You're going to be um, collecting them from your own stock, from your own laying stock. You're going to be getting them locally from someone who is a breeder. Hello, whoever's on, hi. And, uh, or you're going to be ordering them online and they're going to be shipped hatching eggs. So the first thing I kind of want to go through is what you're going to do to prepare your eggs, depending on what kind of source you get them from. If you obtain them from your own flock, you're going to want to collect them over a period of like, I usually do up to seven days. You can go longer, um, but the important thing to remember when you're collecting your own eggs is you're going to want to put them in something like this like an egg carton of some type. Um, so you can rotate them on a daily basis. You wanna turn them like this a couple of times a day. And what I like to do is I use um, these paper mache egg flats. I get them off of Amazon and they're specifically for quail eggs. Hello, Sherry. And what I do is I put them on a tabletop um, just at room temperature and I prop something up underneath one of the sides of the quail egg flat that I'm using. And then the next day or that evening, I'll prop up um, it on the opposite side. So what this does, hi Christina, is it just exercises the yolk. So you're keeping your eggs nice and fresh and they're not going to be like stagnant in one area of that egg the whole time you're collecting them for incubation. Now, if you're going to be um, getting them from a local source, I would suggest doing the same thing. Ask for sure how old those eggs are first though, so you know the last day that you're safe to be putting them in the incubator. After, I say between nine and 10 days, they start to lose that uh, their viability as far as um, the fertility goes, you'll start to drop in fertility rate. Um, but if you're going to be getting them from a shipped source, then the procedure is a little bit different before you want to put them in the incubator. So for shipped eggs, you'll likely get them in a box with foam holders. And what you want to do is when you get them home, you want to take them out of the foam, put them in something similar to this egg flat, and you're going to let them rest for, I like 24 hours. That way, if they were cold in transit, if they really got jumbled around in transit, then you're um, gonna let that egg settle down and hopefully that air cell is going to reattach and any kind of damage that has been done during that shipping process, you're gonna be able to kind of have that um, stabilize itself before you start putting it in the incubator. So I have a question. Do you offer hatching eggs or live birds only? So Sherry, what I do is um, I typically, all of my incubated eggs go into the incubator or we keep them for eating. I do, if I have extras, put them with um, like a little gift bag in my chick order deliveries. So my people who order chicks from me, um, most of the time will get free hatching eggs with their chick order, but I don't typically sell hatching eggs. And here's why, just a little backstory. Um, for high, high fertility, usually people keep like one rooster to four hens. I here prefer to keep one rooster to the minimum of six to seven hens. So my fertility rate is usually around 70%. Um, and that's why I don't sell hatching eggs because I, I don't focus on that high fertility rate. Uh, of course, if you get them from me, a lot of them will hatch. But again, that's not like what my system is set up for. So that's why I focus on chick orders and any that don't hatch, I don't have a problem with at home. You know, that's just how, how we roll, how we roll here. Um, so yes, that makes sense. <laughs> so if you guys get your shipped uh, eggs to you and you've set them and they've been resting for 24 hours, um, 
they're at room temperature, you're fine to put them right into, into the incubator at that point. There is a difference that um, I would suggest doing as far as your egg turners go when you're incubating, however. So if you're using your own or locally sourced eggs, you can put them right into the turner day one and the turners can start moving and that's perfect. The, the procedure that I do with shipped eggs though is I turn off my turner for at least the first 48 hours. Sometimes I'll go 72 hours if I feel like the egg, um, the air cells and the eggs are really moving around a lot um, and there's been damage to the box and things like that, I'll give, the, I'll give it three days. So what that does is it just allows the eggs more time to, again, settle the air, the air cells to be where they are, it, where they should be, um, and it just gives them a better start that way for shipped egg options. So as, let me try to go through this checklist in my mind. For ship egg suppliers or shipped egg suppliers, I have a couple favorites and um, each are my favorites depending on what it is that I'm looking to source. So for jumbo eggs, for um, bloodlines that hatch true, I really, really love Southwest game birds and I also really love Kansas City quail. For really interesting colors uh, that you'll get a mix of, some interesting genetics that may not necessarily hatch true, but they're really interesting to work with. And I have extremely high hatch rates from this source is my Shire Farm. Um, and for Celadon eggs, um, Celadons are blue. Um, I really, really am careful of where I go uh, for Celadon eggs because I like to know um, the percentage if they're true blues. And for true blues, I love Nicole from Reno Quail and um, Sadie Girl Farms is great. And also there are some great lines from Southwest Game Birds also for Celadon that have a high um, hatch rate for uh, Celadon layers. Hello, Danny. nice to see you guys. Okay, so when you go into incubation for the first time, there are some issues that I want to cover so you guys won't make the same mistakes, hopefully, that I made for the first couple rounds of incubation that I ever did. Um, it's gonna take you a little while to figure out your machine and to really understand how it works, how it's going to work for you and for your eggs specifically, but there are some things that you can do to help yourself out and to help your hatch out. The number one thing is to make sure that you get a good incubator. And it doesn't have to be like a crazy expensive one, it doesn't have to be a gigantic one. I don't even personally use like the big cabinet incubators that a lot of people suggest. Um, I love tabletop incubators and I choose forced air options. And that means that there's a fan unit in that incubator. There are still air options, I don't personally have experience with still air incubators. The temperature levels with those are gonna be a little different, so do Google that if you end up with one of those. But um, more than anything, I would suggest that you stay away from no name brands that you can get on Amazon. They tend to be the cheapest. They tend to look like they're decent machines. And I actually ended up with two of those for my first go around. And they're just really, really typically inefficient and they're going to stress you out and you're not gonna have very high, high hatch rates with those. So my best suggestion, if you are looking to spend like $150, would be go with the Barado uh, Luma 8. And that incubator is what I suggest everybody starts with. There is, um, they're pre-dialed in, so you don't have to worry about temperature. Um, the humidity, the way you use it is just so easy. It's so, so simple. So it's more like a set and leave it type of machine and you don't have to worry about your levels so much with that. Um, Brincy is also a great brand. It is more expensive. Um, the Nurture Right 360, I've heard a lot of good things about that, but you do have to, I believe you have to purchase the egg turner separately. So my first choice would be the Barado um, Luma 8. If you can get a bigger option, that's great. But even the small one has, I believe it's a 34 
uh, quail egg count that, that you can put in there at one time. So it's a pretty decent um, size for just home hackers. So just a couple of things that I that I say that everybody needs when they get an incubator, unless you go with a Burrato uh, Luma, is a secondary thermometer. Um, this is going to be what saves your hatches. So if you're going with like a Hoova Bader or if you're going with one of the styrofoam units, um, farm innovators, what you're likely going to encounter is the thermometer and the hygrometer that's built into the unit is not going to be accurate and that's going to mess up your hatches. Um, you're going to think that you have everything set the exact temperature and the exact humidity and then you go through your hatch and then maybe five ten percent of your chicks actually come out of their shells and then you're messaging me and you're being what like what's going on what's wrong and it's because you trusted the the readings that were coming from the thermometers hygrometers within the unit that you bought so secondary thermometer is super super important unless you're going with a burrato um or a brincy this thermometer is expensive i think it was like 70 dollars but i started out with one of those cheap machines and this is something that i just needed it just to hatch anything out of it this was required this is a brincy spot check and i get it right off of the brincy um, website um <clears throat> it does not have the hygrometer in here it's just the thermometer reader. So you can set this in your unit if you're unsure if you can trust it or not in the various areas of your incubator. And this will help you determine if you have really hot spots or cold spots in your machine. And those hot spots are gonna be areas and cold spots that you're gonna to wanna to stay away from. So depending on where the heat source is on the incubator model that you have is gonna depend on um, where the safe zone is for you to put eggs. So this guy is going to really help you um, stay away from those those spots that are going to be like way over 100 degrees, like 101, 102, 103 degrees. So you avoid those spots. Now the hygrometer that I love, um, the, the Burrato incubators do not come with a hygrometer reader. You can buy the secondary, like, like a secondary hygrometer unit that really, um, automatically adjusts the humidity in your machine, but they're expensive and they're really, really not necessary. This guy was like seven bucks on Amazon. And what I do is I get the, the dial version, this, ki this type, not the digital, because moisture going into the digital, as soon as you put eggs into lockdown, that humidity goes way up. And I really don't find that the uh, digital ones last more than a couple hatches, but one of these works great. And the thing that I look for is the hygrometers that people are using specifically for like their cigar boxes. Those tend to be really dialed in and they're super accurate. So if you can get one of these off of Amazon, you're really good to go. And this is pretty much all I go by. Um, okay, so just basics of um, incubation. If you guys have questions in the meantime, please feel free to ask. Um, so the temperature and humidity levels. This, this set of numbers is what you're going to go by for day zero, which is the first day that you set your eggs. We're going to call day zero all the way to day 14. Okay. So they, your eggs are in your turners day zero to 14, unless they're ship eggs, then they're in your turners from like day 13 or day three to 14. Um, but the temperature that I aim for is 99.5 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I set my Burrato to 99.7. That's the manufacturer's recommendations. And I always have awesome hatches, just keeping it at that um, level that the manufacturer suggests for that. But anywhere between 99.5, 100, you're gonna be good to go. So that temperature for me, stays the same throughout the whole process um, from set to hatch out. Now, if you have a machine that again is a little wonky, a tip that I like to give is your um, temperature is likely going to be different at the level that the eggs are sitting at when they're in their egg turners versus the lower level that they're sitting at when they're on the hatching tray. 
Sorry, I've got blue coat on my hands. <laughs> so sorry about that purple. Um, but with your spot check or with your secondary thermometer, before you set anything, check the level, the top level of the eggs where they sit in your turner. Right here is where you want to check that temperature level when they're in the turner. And then also put that egg down on its side on your hatching tray and take that temperature where that that top level of the egg is sitting on your hatching tray. Those numbers are gonna be really important for you to jot down for you to know ahead of time. So when you're transitioning your eggs from day 14 into lockdown and you're taking them off the turners and putting them onto your hatching trays, you're not going to have like a couple degrees difference because typically the temperature is gonna be lower on the hatching tray if it's further away from your heat source than it is when they're on the turner. So that's a mistake that is common. We'll take the eggs right off the hatching tray because we know that the temperature's dialed in. Then come lockdown, we'll put them on the hatching, um, um, sorry, on the, take them off of the rails, put them on the hatching tray, and then it's going to be a temperature difference and then your, your eggs are not hatching out. And it's because of that temperature dip. The metabolism of the chicken there is slowing down because it's cooler. They're not able to absorb their yolk really as fast as they should. It's day 18, day 19, you're still not getting a hatch out. So that's a common troubleshooting um, tip to kind of keep in your mind. If you're getting late hatchers, then make sure you're double checking your temperatures at both those levels. Now opposite would go, if your heat source is on your bottom, the bottom of the machine, then if that's the case, your temperature is going to be higher on um, the at the level of the hatching tray and lower at the level of the, the turners. So again, it's just about learning your machine, taking some quick, quick notes, jotting down those areas. Um, so you know if you have to bump up the temperature or bump it down or just keep it the same when it's um, day 14. So what is day 14? It is lockdown. Hi Deb! And lockdown is the day that you want to transition from just regular incubation to getting your babies that are in their shells ready to hatch out. So on day 14, a couple of things are happening. They are positioning themselves for hatching and they're also internally pipping inside that egg. Um, so what we need to do is we move them from the turner, they're in this position, pointy side down always. The bump side, big bump side is always facing up when you put your eggs in your, in your incubator. But on day 14, a lockdown day. We take them out of the turners and we lay them flat on our hatching trays. When we do this, your babies are going to start moving around inside, getting to the proper hatching position, and they're going to be internally pipping, starting to breathe air inside that egg. And then we're also going to be um, changing the humidity that's inside the unit. And what that does when we boost up the humidity is it makes the shell easier for them to crack open because it starts to absorb more moisture and it softens up, okay? So lockdown, um, a lot of people do lockdown on day 15, but I really, really suggest day 14. That way, if your chicks are pipped on the inside, there's a lot of liquid and stuff in there still, and we don't wanna drown them by moving them around too much when they're trying to internally pip. So if you get them on their side, day 14, likely you'll get them in that position before they internally pip, and you're not, you're not putting them in any kind of um, situation where they might be moving around and moisture could be something that they're ingesting and all that, 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 that won't necessarily go well for them. So, um, humidity for day 14, actually, I'm sorry, humidity for day zero to 14 is, I aim for 35% humidity. Um, and be careful on what time of the year it is that you're hatching out. So that's why it's important to have one of these guys. Humidity in your house is going to be different, whether it's winter, summer, you're running a wood stove, air conditioning, all that stuff is gonna affect it. So um, keeping an eye on every hatch that you do, and just make sure that it's just 
that you're trusting this and not like a habit of, oh, I put this much water in and we're good to go. Because sometimes that much water could be 35% humidity in your machine and then 50% humidity on your in your machine a different time of year. So zero to 14 days, I aim for 35% humidity. Come 14, day 14 on lockdown, I bump that up to 65 to 70% humidity. You guys are going to get a lot of different opinions about what humidity and what temperatures to go with. This is just what works for me. And again, what works for my machines uh, that I use on a regular basis. So those are my levels that I shoot for. The thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to start your humidity off at like 80 because when you first when you have your first baby starting to hatch out they're naturally going to come out wet and there's going to be moisture within the eggs and all that stuff so they're going to start boosting the humidity within the incubator on their own too the more they hatch out so what's going to happen if you set your water to 60 degree or your humidity to 60 65 degrees they're going to start hatching they're going to bump it up to 70 degrees 70 or 70% 75% um, humidity, and that's gonna be fine for them, but you're not going to be having too much humidity in there to make it a slippery environment where they can't zip after they've pipped, okay? Um, so lockdown time is the time that they need to hatch out. This can last, I get people asking me what day my, my babies typically hatch out. What happens on day 14, internally pipping, day 15 is internally pipping. Um, typically mine uh, will externally pip on day 16. And then when you see external pips, those are the little cracks in the shell. Um, typically 24 hours after that, you'll get that first chick come out, that second chick come out, and then it's like popcorn babies all over the place um, between day 17 and 18. You can have late hatchers. so. There's a couple of reasons why you might have um, chicks hatching out on day 19, day 20, day 21 even. And that is mainly due to fluctuations with your temperature and humidity within your unit. Um, and also if you're opening your um, incubator. So we don't want to open the incubator. <laughs> After when it When it's lockdown time, lockdown means you're locking that baby up you really don't want to open it because there's some important things that are happening within that machine that's going to help trigger that baby to come out of its shell. One of those is keeping the humidity the way it needs to be, but also it's allowing um, CO2 to become to acquire <laughs> within the unit and build up within the unit. That CO2 um, increase from those babies breathing and exhaling is going to be something that triggers them to hatch out. So if we're constantly opening the, the unit, the machine, when we're letting out the humidity, letting in cold air, uh, we're letting out the CO2, letting in more oxygen, we can actually be um, dragging out that hatching process. So that can be a reason why your babies are hatching out later um, and not right on day 17, eight, day 18. Um, <clears throat> I think that's pretty much it for levels. Yep, temperature stays the same. Like I've mentioned, I keep my temperature 99.5 um, for hatch out and the whole incubation period up to hatch out. Some people, put it down to 98, some people bump it up to 100. If you're if you're like right around that, you're fine. Um, but yeah, it, it keeps it pretty simple for me. So if you guys have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I think we're good to go. And of course, if you guys post something, I'll get back to you too in the comments. But, oh, I did wanna mention one more thing. Mm -hmm. One more thing is um, assisting hatches. So this is something that's like super controversial when you're on, when you're online and you post about whether or not to help chicks out. Um, I and you guys can you guys can can do whatever you're comfortable with, but 
this this is the one time that I will um, assist, and it's the only time I'll assist. Um, and that is when a chick has pipped a hole and they've completely zipped around, but maybe they've put like like a little Morse code do 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 around their egg all the way around but they like still have some of that membrane, just a little, little pieces of that membrane are um, still attached to that. And they're just in a position where they're just, they're just not able to quite pop that top off. If I see them in that, in that spot and they're fluffing up inside that egg, I know that there's no physical defects because they've fully zipped around and done all the good things that they need to do. It's just maybe there's the little, little membranes just stuck there, right? So that's that's really the only time that I'll assist. And honestly, it's like, just like, oop, taking your nail and go, there you go, take that little membrane piece off. And then the baby just flies out of there and it's, thank God I'm out of this thing because, you know, I, I should have been fluffed up 24 hours ago type of situation. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't intervene um, unless it's that or or unless I see that that baby is really working to zip and then that beak gets jammed in that shell and the beak is hanging out of the shell and it's very clearly stuck in there. The beak is stuck. Um, and yeah, those are the only two two times that I will, I will assist. If I do have an assisted um, baby, I will put them right back in the incubator and they stay in there for 24 hours. So that's another question that people have. How long do you keep your babies in the incubator um, after they hatch out? I like to do at least 24 hours, um, especially if there's a lot pipping in there. Like I said, you don't wanna open that incubator and let that humidity and CO2 out. So um, I will let as many hatch out as possible without me touching that machine. Um, taking a mental note when that first baby was hatched out, what time, what day it was. And then 24 hours after that, if I see the majority of the stuff has hatched, then I will very quickly, very easily take those babies out of there, close it back up again, and I'll let that machine go um, at least until day 20. Day 20 is usually when I'll turn my machines off. The... Um, Exception for that would be if I have really expensive shipped eggs. Uh, sometimes shipped eggs do take a little bit longer to hatch out, depending, you know, again, on how beat up they got, what temperature they were when you received them, all of that stuff. So if you have a really expensive order of eggs and you just want to get like every little thing that you can get out of it, I uh, would leave it for 23 days um, before I shut the unit off typically. But the longer those eggs bake in there, usually the less um, the less healthy and robust those babies are. So I will uh, only include chicks that hatch out on that day that they should be hatching out, and all of them are hatching out together. Let's say day 17, day 18. The majority of the chicks come out on day 17 those are the ones that I know that I'll be using in a future breeding program. Ones that come out on day 19, day 20, day 21, I may you know, keep them in with all their brothers and sisters, but I will either mark them with like, um, like a food dye, just a little dot of food dye, or I'll band them or I'll keep them in a separate brooder. And I know that those are not babies that I will put into a future breeding program just because I want the healthiest ones that that are on schedule um, as breeders. So, okay. All right, so I will look for questions, but I hope you guys have a great day. And if you do have any um, troubleshooting issues when it comes to like incubating and you're you're just not having the hatch rates that you want, uh, let me know. Oh, oh, I just looked over here and there was something else I was gonna tell you guys. <laughs> so <clears throat> let's talk really quickly. I'm all over the place. Don't you love that? Real quickly about candling. <laughs> Candling is important, so I can't hang up with you yet. So candling is <clears throat> how you're going to look inside your eggs to see, are they fertile? Are they not? Is there something living in there? Is there not? Um, and this is something that you can do just for out of your own curiosity. Um, but more importantly, 
so you don't put rotting eggs into your incubator during lockdown time because those little babies, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, I have a little tickle in my throat. Those little babies can, um, or lack of babies, can turn into little rotten, rotten balls that you don't want in your incubator. When your little ones are hatching out, they can burst, they can get bacteria all over the place. It's not something that you wanna deal with. So candling is something that's really important for the health of your hatch. They can, okay, for the health of your, of your final hatch. So this is a basic candler. It's not the best, but it's just the one that I ended up getting first. So this one came off of Amazon. Um, and <clears throat> what I do when I, uh, I'm getting ready to set new eggs is I will candle before I put them in on day zero and just go into a dark place like a closet or a bathroom or anything like that. Take your set of eggs that you have and hold it up like this. And I like to candle from the top. You guys aren't going to be able to see right now other than my purple spray on my hands. Um, you won't be able to see anything in there right now because it's really light in this room. So if you go to a dark spot, this, this little thing will light up like a little light bulb. And what you're going to look for on um, <clears throat> the first candling that you do is any cracks. You want to make sure that if you see any damage to that shell, that's not one that you're going to put in your incubator at all. Okay. Um, all the other ones can go in there unless they're really oddly shaped. What you want is, shape-wise, what you want is a nice big round top. You don't want it to be like a torpedo egg. I don't know if I have a torpedo egg here to show you. I don't. I don't have a torpedo egg. Um, but you want it to be a nice round shape, okay? Sorry, lighting is terrible in here today round shape and not super pointy, not super oblong, um, just a good round, nice round egg, okay? Um, <clears throat> so once you check for cracks, get rid of the ones that are cracked, those can go into your incubator. Uh, the next time I candle, some people candle at day five, day seven to check for fertility, um, but I just like to run my eggs until day 14 and then I'll candle once before they go into lockdown. So again, when I um, do my candling and it's before lockdown, I will take everything out of the incubator, put them into flats like this on day 14, bring them into a dark place, lift each one of them up and candle from the top. The reason why I candle from the top is because this air sac is going to be up here. And just when I candle it, I can just see a lot better when I'm candling from the top versus setting them on the candler like this. It's just, I just prefer seeing it in that on that angle. Um, I typically see a lot more. And then what you're looking for on day 14 when you're candling is you're looking for development. Most of this egg should be dark in color on the inside. You should see a nice area on the top that is um, empty. That is your air cell. That's the spot that your babies are going to start pipping their little beaks, putting their little beaks through, and they're gonna start breathing in that area, okay? Which is again, why I don't like like tipping, your, you don't wanna take your egg and like start tipping it around like this and all that. Like keep it just nice the way that, um, it should be positioned from your turners when you're putting them in, onto a candler. And then sometimes I will see a little bit of um, space in the bottom here because it's just still day 14. So they still have 15, 16 to develop. They might just get bigger within those, those days and having a little room down here is perfectly fine. They still have their yolk that has not been absorbed yet and all that. So you'll see a little fluid, you'll see the air cell. And what's cool is on day 14, sometimes even you'll see the air cell has um, turned and it's more of like a diagonal angle and that means your babies are getting real close to hatching out. So when they when they start moving like this, the air cell starts 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 uh, taking on that shape. You know that your baby is going to be coming out real soon. So that's exciting. Um, what you don't want to see on day fourteen is when you candle your egg, the whole thing like lights up like a bulb. Okay, and you can see like through the whole thing because that, that will just tell you that the egg is not developed. There's no baby in there. Um, sometimes you might see something like a little blood ring. Those, those, are early, um, those are early deaths 
and that's not something that needs to go into lockdown. Again, if you see cracks that you missed, again, those don't need to go into lockdown. The ones that go into lockdown are the ones that are fully formed in there. You see the air cell, you see the baby chick, the dark area at least, um, and those are good to go into lockdown. Um, <clears throat> I think that's it this time. I think I covered everything I wanna cover, okay? All right, so I will keep my eyes open on the comments. I hope you, again, have a great day, and I will talk to you guys soon. Bye!